Okay, I guess we should get started. Um, I hate microphones. I can't move around and like wave my arms with them, but I'll have to make do anyway. So uh, this is a session called uh, Manage Those Dependencies. And as you could guess already, um, my name is Jacob. And my Twitter handle happens to be exactly my name. So if you want to uh, to say something during, uh, during the talk, uh, give some feedback, or maybe you just want to access the slides afterwards, then I'm going to write those things on, uh, on Twitter. And uh, I've been, uh, been coding a lot for a long time, many different companies, many different languages, and so on. But I don't want to stand here and like recite my resume. So you can just look me up yourselves if you want to. Uh, what I do want to say is that I'm from Sweden. And uh, is anyone else in here from Sweden? There are actually two. Awesome. Then you can talk now. Because <clears throat> uh, when I go places and say that I'm from Sweden, people most often at least have some, uh, some kind of idea of what Sweden is like. And uh, most people th think something like this. <laughs> that ev everyone walks around in like a, a coat and uh, like these brutish men and uh, and always complaining about the fact that winter is coming. <laughs> but but I tell you, Sweden is nothing like that because Ned Stark have no idea what winter is like. You have no idea what winter is like. <laughs> this is what winter is like. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm not here to talk about the weather, but to talk about dependency management once again. And uh, before I start, I just want to say this. <laughs> so uh, yeah, use your brain. Like, uh, don't take everything as truth. But uh, yeah, you use the bits and pieces that you find useful and, uh, and question everything. And also, I, I'm not here to talk about building like, home pages for your kitten. I'm here to talk about actual apps, building, building real apps that are complex and somewhat huge, at least. And let's start with some, some quizzing. Uh, I actually found this quote a while back uh, that said, uh, it was talking about a particular piece of technology, and it said that it's a piece of the stack that's been notably missing for years, and after using it for a while now, I'm not sure how I lived without it. And when I googled around for this a bit, I realized that people have, had been saying this about source control. Like, uh, I started out coding without source control for, I think, maybe three years or so when I was in high school. And I often copied my folders to like back up things in case I would screw something up uh, until next day or whatever. So this could definitely be said about source control. But it has also been said about something else in this case. Uh, and uh, you can probably guess, but let, let's rewind the tape and, uh, and look about what's happened in, uh, in a couple of different environments. So. I personally, at least, discovered Unix in about 99. Before that, I was purely a Windows guy. And the, f the thing I found coolest about Unix, of, of all the things, was the fact that you never like, downloaded uh, these uh, executable files to install stuff and had to choose which directory and where in your start menu you wanted things to be installed. You had a command, a simple one-liner, that installed something for you. And you could put this as part of a script that would like install a whole setup or uh, install a machine to the exact specifications that you wanted, and that that was really cool in my opinion. Uh, and then as time went by, I discovered the Mac as well and realized that oh, there's software for the Mac that can actually do this as well, even if it's not as out of the box as as pure Unix. Uh, and, and suddenly it started appearing in programming languages as well. Uh, I first encountered it in Ruby. Uh, where you have Ruby gems, uh, where you do exactly the same thing. You install the, the piece of software that you want to use alongside your own code. And it, it's not limited to, uh, to software or to building software anymore, but even actual, actual end users follow this pattern now since, since the App Store. Uh, 
where you just you go to some place and you download and you install and it's done. You can't really script it, but it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, and lately I've been doing a lot of Node.js where you have exactly the same thing again with NPM. So, of course, you know what I'm getting at already, uh, the theme at least. So, this quote, once again, was taken from uh, one of the Microsoft evangelists talking about the Microsoft stack, and in particular, the, the tool called Nugget, which does exactly this for the .NET framework. So, so even Microsoft is catching on. Uh, but what I want to ask here today, and since this is the front end track, is what's the JS approach to this? I am not talking no JS, I'm talking about client side browser stuff. How do we manage dependencies in general? And that, as usual with all kinds of technologies and all processes and so on, there's a ton of different ways. But the most common one, and the one I think you've all used uh, from time to time, May, maybe still, is to find a library that you want to use, like jQuery. Everyone wants to use jQuery. So you look it up on the web, <coughs> you download the source, uh, you put it in a folder somewhere structured in, in your project, uh, and then you let the global pollution begin. Because you want another library, and you want another library. So this pollution, that's just the beginning. You start like piling these things on top of each other, like all these different things that you want to use, that you find somewhere. And, and, and this picture is even not that descriptive. I feel it's more like this usually. And it becomes a maintenance nightmare. And I suppose most of you have actually felt this if you work with uh, front-end development. Don't touch the wires. Yeah, don't touch the, the dependencies we've downloaded because this thing only works with this version and this thing only works with that and it's a house of cards. And it, that's not the whole story because it also brings a whole bunch of stupid habits uh, going about this uh, in this way. So, for example, we start to, uh, we want to minimify our, our sources, right? And concat files before we deploy. Uh, and that's kind of a problem, because if there's not a semicolon in the end of a file that you're concatenating with another, you can run into problems. So people start adding semicolons to the beginning of their files, which is like, what? What are you doing? <clears throat> Why do we need to do stupid hacks like that? And we start to do like premature minimification. Every, everything we download uh, can be downloaded as a minimified version or a non-minimified version. And if we download the non-minimified, we have to do it ourselves. And if we download the minimified one, we have to, uh, uh, we have a hard time debugging our code. So maybe we download both of them and, and even start increasing the mess even more. Uh, because we want to minimify in the end anyway, not like before we've finished. And there's also no choice but to check in dependencies. That's like a, a discussion of its own, whether or not you should actually do that. But in this case, you have to, because you have downloaded them from a, an arbitrary source, and, and you have to put them alongside your code. And since, since we're already copy and pasting libraries, uh, like uh, jQuery this and this version, and underscore this and that version, and, and so on, why not copy and paste some small pieces of code that we have in our different projects, because those are like libraries, right? So we, we, we kind of encourage copy and paste coding by, by di just downloading source and putting it in, in our projects. So if you ask me, the whole thing is like, this is my feeling about it. It's just shit. And you can ask, like, why? Why is it this way? Why, why are we developing this way? Why? Why are we, as web developers, doing this in, in a different way than other people? And I, I think the problem, uh, of course, originates with the fact that the web is, is like a toy. It's like uh, JavaScript. It's, uh, it's for adding, uh, adding uh, stars that blink on, on your site, right? <clears throat> so web developers, for a very long time, have been seen like this for more like system-close developers. It's like a toy language, a toy environment where you do toy things, uh, or like a, an ad person or something creating a, a website. But it's, 
is not true anymore, right? <laughs> it's not like that. And haters gonna hate, but front-end devs were like script kiddies. It, it's not like that anymore, right? You know it. And uh, just to back it up, uh, JavaScript is like super popular. Uh, if you look at GitHub, uh, JavaScript is uh, is actually 21% of the entire uh, code there. And uh, I actually I actually updated this slide just a month ago, and I created it first a year ago. And obviously, JavaScript is even more popular now. It was like 19 before, and now 21. And the funny thing is that none of the others had changed at all, except one that changed 1%. I don't remember which one. But the big change that had happened was that CoffeeScript was suddenly here. One year ago, CoffeeScript wasn't on the top 10 chart. So these 3% are actually JavaScript as well, in a sense. So JavaScript is really, really increasing in popularity, and, and the medieval ages are kind of over. We're not doing, want to do, we don't want to do things uh, in a playful, just copy and pasting kind of way anymore. So that's, that's what this talk is, is all about. And uh, my idea is to cover a couple of different methods uh, for dealing with this, or, or tools, rather. Uh, so, these are the ones that I want to talk about, uh, and I can, could start by asking, is there anyone in here who know what all of these are, just from looking at the logos? Up with your hands in that case. One, maybe. Okay, then, then you can leave because you know everything already, but uh, th the rest of you have something to learn at least, and hopefully you'll run, learn something new as well. Uh, so I'm going to run through these uh, rather quickly, but just talk about what is it, uh, how is it different compared to the other ones, and what's the like strength and weaknesses in each of these approaches. Uh, but before we actually get to these uh, browser-centric uh, tools, uh, I first want to say something about npm, uh, which is the Node Package Manager, uh, and I suppose. Most of you know about Node, at least, which is a JavaScript environment uh, or a platform for running JavaScript on the server. Uh, but how many in here have actually worked with Node? Uh, just a few. OK, good. So then it's useful to actually go through this. So um, in, um, in uh, Node, you, uh, you simply do something like this when you want to, uh, to install uh, a library that someone else has written. Uh, on the command line, oh, it's actually really dark. Well, I, I hope you can see it. Uh, otherwise, you simply have to, uh, have to look up the slides afterwards. Uh, and what I'm saying will hopefully be enough. So we, uh, we use it to install packages. And we do it by just saying npm install and then whatever on the command line. And it installs that. Uh, library into uh, the project that you're currently in, and then you can start using it in your uh, in your uh, server side uh, JavaScript node code. Uh, and you do. I wonder if we can actually increase the light somehow. I guess you can't read this back in back over there, right? Hmm. Um, yeah, not much to do about that now. Um, Sorry? Oh. Wonder where is the switch? Yeah, someone could try. <laughs> uh, talking in darkness, yeah. Okay. Uh, the <laughs> good thing that it's not. Filming my face. Uh, I think the highlighting, most of the text is white, so only parts uh, will be hard to read, and most of it will probably uh, be seen anyway. So, um, and you can do this if you really want to. If you go to speakerdeck.com slash Jacob uh, you can find this presentation uh, and follow it on your own laptop or whatever. But uh, anyway. Uh, Another control question before we continue. How many people in here are actually writing JavaScript now and then? OK, pretty much everyone. That's good. Uh, so 
all the code here is just regular JavaScript except for this uh, require function which we use to import one of the, the modules that we've installed and then we can use whatever functions it exposes uh, like this. We get the object foo and then we, we call the square method on, on the foo object. And it's really easy to like publish a package uh, using npm. You just uh, uh, declare a file like this uh, called uh, package.json where you say the name of your file which or the main name of your project which has to be unique and then you have some metadata here about like uh, uh, what does it do so people understand it and what version is this and uh, uh, what other packages is this depending on and so on so that's what, how npm works and how, how you work with uh, with packages uh, on server-side JavaScript and I'm going to relate back to that when we look at the browser here. So let's start from the beginning and look at the one I think was developed first, and at least was the one I encountered first, uh, which is called Ender. <clears throat> and the, the guys develop, who developed Ender uh, thought of it as the, the no library library, that instead of pulling down lo lots of different libraries, you are supposed to kind of specify that which libraries you want and bundle them together into uh, like the complete package, so to speak, that you need. Uh, and it's, it's also a tool that you use on the command line. You install Ender and then you say Ender build and then you name lots of packages that you want to install. Uh, and uh, uh, another agenda they kind of had was to, uh, to replace jQuery, which was kind of monolithic, where you got all these features at once and maybe you didn't need all of them. So they built a couple of packages that exposed parts of the similar functionality that jQuery had, like a, a DOM ready function, a query language for, uh, for querying DOM nodes using CSS selectors and so on. And then other packages like underscore and yeah, whatever could be installed using Ender. So you just say the names of your packages that you want and Ender automatically fetches them and puts them into a file and you can include that file called Ender.js on your site and now all these things are there. So you don't have to go out uh, and browse the web for these things. And you just use it uh, uh, the, the jQuery way, so to speak. It adds all of these libraries onto the dollar so you can add, use the map function from, uh, from underscore, you can use the querying from uh, the query package and, and so on. But I don't think this is really, really that useful because it makes things a little simpler. You kind of eliminate the need to, uh, to do things arbitrarily and you have a systematic approach. But it's not really structuring things differently because everything ends up on the dollar. So everything you add is kind of global. Uh, there's no, no like resolution or management of how, how these things are supposed to interact. Everything's just crammed together. Uh, and obviously it doesn't play well with jQuery because it uses the dollar. And I've found that quite challenging because it's, honestly, it's hard to, to be without jQuery. And even if you don't use jQuery itself, maybe you need a plugin or two that depends on jQuery, and yeah, then you're fucked. So, uh, moving on, there are some other tools then that have uh, like a larger idea. And one that I really like is the one called Browserify. Uh, and if any of you actually work with this or, uh, uh, or use it, then you will know that this is the version one Browserify logo, not the second one. I've actually not migrated myself, so it would be kind of a lie to, to use the new one up there when I'm talking. But uh, the idea of it is to enable the node style package management in the browser. Uh, and uh, it uses the same pattern as in Node, which is called CommonJS, uh, which is a project with a goal of specifying an ecosystem for JavaScript outside of the browser. And the weird thing now is, of course, that we bring it back to the browser, but yeah, anyway. So it looks like this, exactly like, uh, like when we run code on node, except that now we say require, and then we give a file path, which is where we'll find uh, the files that we want to include. 
So instead of running all our JavaScript as a long series of things in the same file, uh, executing all at once, uh, we can now split our program into separate files and uh, delay the running of them until we say require and then for JS or bar JS and so on. Uh, and then we can start using the things they are exposing. And the way you, you would define the pa uh, package in this case, uh, for example, foo.js, would be to do something like this. Uh, we say exports.square. So we put the square function on an, a magical object called exports. And then we define the function to do whatever we want it to do, uh, squaring, uh, hopefully. So this will then, this exports object will be the thing returned uh, to the foo variable when we say require foo. So everything will be available that we put on the exports object. Uh, and this print line here, console log loaded foo, will be run as well when we include the foo package. And then we do exactly the same thing with the bar package. We just uh, expose some, some variable, we expose some function, uh, yeah, and we print something. So uh, if we run this, what will happen is that the exports objects are returned from foo and bar, respectively. And then we print, uh, we want to print the square of four and uh, yeah, the version of bar and the cube of four. So the order that things will be printed here is that first it will say loaded foo, then it will print the square of four, then it will say loaded bar, and then it will print the, the remaining two things. So the code in these files, are, is, it's not executed until you run require. And that's kind of the important thing. Uh, and now I'm just talking about files that you have locally, of course, but the point is to use this regarding other people's code, of course, so you include something else than what you've written yourself. Uh, and something that we can do is to load code dynamically because the require function takes a string as an argument and that string is not, like, nothing is done with it at compile time. It executes when it executes. So we could toss a coin and randomize whether we want to load the foo or the bar package and then try to use the result that comes out of that uh, and, and log the version of that package. And since the foo package we had before didn't contain a, a version variable, that will print undefined if it loads the foo package, and if it loads the bar package, it will print yeah, whatever version we put in there. So, so you can do this. It's kind of weird. I, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's something anyone has ever done uh, for a good reason in production, but it's possible. Uh, so where, where Browserify comes in here is that Browserify is a little tool that takes this code that you write in this way and adds kind of the glue to make this work in the browser. So once again, after you've written your code, you have to, uh, you have to use a command line tool to say that I want to Browserify my main.js file. Uh, and I want it to output a new file called bundle.js. And it will open the main.js file, and it will figure out uh, what other files it uh, depends on, and then uh, produce this bundle file. And then you can add the bundle file into your site, just as with, uh, uh, with Ender. So, <coughs> uh, like I said, we can use this relative required uh, to files that we have in our own uh, file system, or we can say require and then the name of a module, for example, uh, DOM ready, uh, which exposes a module that we have not written but is stored in the NPM index and is put right into our program automatically. So it's, it's like Ender uh, in the way that you install packages by naming them, but it doesn't put everything into the global scope and makes it available everywhere, but it returns it to a particular variable, and then you can use that in its own context. You can include it in just one of your files. You can include it 
uh, inside a function. Uh, I think I actually have an example of that. Yeah. Instead of just requiring a file uh, everywhere, you can put it inside of a function scope and just use it where you need to use it, and then it won't clash with other things that your program depends on. And it's, it works really simply. Uh, it's a really simple process, actually. Uh, you don't really have to understand it, but the only thing it does is that it wraps all of the files that you've written that looks like regular global JavaScript code into, uh, it pastes it into a boilerplate that looks like this, where the top is the name of the file, and then it exposes a few variables that are the, the magic ones that enables this whole thing, like the exports we've already seen and they're required to, to load the other files. Uh, and uh, of course, require, or browserify creates this require and this define function that's, that's running here. But you don't really have to know the details. You can read, read about it yourself. Uh, and a cool thing is that this resolves nested dependencies. So if I, uh, if I use Browserify and I load jQuery, then when I say require jQuery, I will get a variable back uh, that is my jQuery object. And I don't have to put that on the dollar. I can name it whatever I want to. So if I have something else that uses the dollar, uh, it's totally okay. And if I want to require one, one version of jQuery in one function and another version of jQuery in another function, that's also completely okay because those functions are isolated and if I require two different jQueries, that works perfectly fine. And even better, if I use a plugin or I use some code that requires some version of jQuery, NPM will automatically get that dependency for me. If I need, for example, uh, maybe some of you have used uh, Backbone for building like a, a client-side architecture, MVC so, and so on. It uses underscore uh, as a dependency. And if, uh, if you're using a jQuery plugin, that obviously requires jQuery to run. So you just have to, uh, you just have to ask for the thing you want and all dependencies that are needed to make that work are downloaded automatically and hidden inside of that. You don't even know that it's installed. And therefore, you can have different versions of jQuery at the same time supporting different, uh, different plugins that you run. <coughs> and you don't see any of that complexity. It's, it just works. <coughs> so it, uh, in summary, it kind of unites the way you think of server and client if, if you work with Node and JavaScript in that way. You just do it exactly the same way as you would if you were in a server environment. Uh, and if we look at the pros and cons then, it's kind of a very simple and reasonable model. You just, uh, you just ask for the things you want, and if they are available in the global registry, it downloads them from there, puts it in, uh, gets all the dependencies. You only worry about the top layer. Uh, you don't have to think about what's underneath. And you get all the power and popularity of NPM, which is the fastest growing uh, package uh, manager uh, right now. Um, a downside, of course, is that it still bundles everything into one file. So you can't really control how to, um, how to load these scripts on your site. For example, if you want different scripts on different pages on your site, then you have to run Browserify multiple times, once for each site. And you can't do dynamic things, or you can do dynamic things, but if you want to, for example, load something when someone not opens a new page but clicks a particular button or, uh, uh, or uh, deletes something or whatever, uh, if you want to load a new JavaScript file at that moment to use some, some new features, then you have to package that using Browserify as well. So you have to run Browserify once for each little use case you have in your application if you can't just bundle everything into one file and you're satisfied with that. So <clears throat> that brings us to the next one, which is require.js, which I suppose a uh, few of you have heard about. Some hands to see uh, up with your hands if you heard about it or used it. N not that many, OK. Um, so the goal with require.js is 
kind of the same thing. They, they also want to solve this problem, but they do it in a quite, quite different way. And an important difference compared to the NPM and, and Browserify solution is that Require.js is not a package manager. Uh, Browserify is not a package manager either. M NPM is the package manager. It has all the packages, it knows all about the dependencies and so on. Browserify is a tool to download these dependencies and put them together in a structured way that makes it usable for you. So what Require.js <coughs> is, is similar to Browserify. It doesn't download anything for you. Uh, or no, no it's, even, if it's even more specific than Browserify. It, it doesn't download anything for you the same way Browserify does. It's not aware of any package managing system. It's not aware of NPM. It's just a way to, uh, uh, to bundle files together uh, in a more generic way than the other tools did. So let's look quickly at how that works. Uh, confusingly, <laughs> require also creates a global function called require, just like Browserify did. But it's not the same function. This is a completely different one. They just use the same name. <coughs> so competition deluxe. Uh, this require function does not return a value. It's asynchronous, like uh, like a, using Ajax or set timeout or whatever. It takes a function as a callback argument. So here, instead, you give it an array of all the, the files or, or packages that you want to uh, include. And then this function will return objects uh, containing those, uh, those files or, or packages so that you can use them inside of this function doesn't return it in the normal way. And obviously there's a big difference here uh, because this enables us to, to delay the loading of this, uh, this package. We don't have to return it. So if, if we have to wait a while, if it has to be downloaded like uh, on the fly, this would not block the program the same way as Browserify would have done. Uh, because JavaScript only has one thread, and if a function takes a long time to return, we can't do anything else, so that's not okay. But in this case, the program could continue running. <coughs> and IDEA is exactly the same as in, uh, in Browserify. Uh, you just uh, build up an object that uh, exposes all the functionality that you want to expose from your package, and you return it. But obviously, it doesn't return immediately, like I said. Instead, you just... Uh, uh, you return it from this function inside here. So we can expose a, a function called foo and a variable called var, for example. Uh, and instead of writing the dependencies this way, where we say that I want, I want to depend on object one and object two, and then have them passed into this function, I can actually use the, the same syntax as in uh, the common JS-like alternative that Browserify uses. We can just say require and then the name of the dependency and, and get it back immediately. Uh, if we don't pass the array and give a require argument instead. And this is just syntactic sugar. It does exactly the same thing as what you saw before. It's still asynchronous. It still, uh, it still works exactly this way. It's just a different syntax for specifying uh, these names that might look more familiar then. Uh, but the, the difference, of course, is that this is statically analyzed. Uh, Require.js looks through your source code and reads all these require uh, statements to know what it should, lo should be loading when this function starts. So, so uh, having these dynamic dependencies, like we did before with the toying costs and then loading something arbitrarily, that won't work here. Because the, uh, the packages will start to load before the code is run. Like here, we start loading dependency one, dependency two, before this function executes. So they are passed into the function as arguments. <clears throat> but that's not really a problem because no one does that anyway. But just to understand the kind of limitation. Uh, so the difference here is that the loading of our modules is lazy. It doesn't happen as we write it uh, 
and we then have to wait for it. But it, it starts when we write that we want to use them, but it doesn't continue running uh, the piece of code that uses them until they're ready. And like I said also, there's no package manager coupling. It doesn't depend on a particular system to fetch these, uh, these packages, but you can add, you, you can use any package manager that's compatible with require. Um, so, uh, if we, in this case, want to, we, we want to load some new code when we click a particular button or so on. We don't move to a new page, so we don't reload the page automatically, but we just want some new code to be usable. Then this would be a perfect approach because uh, we, uh, it will be able to load that on demand, like exactly uh, when that code executes and not block. And it automatically generates like which, uh, it, it splits your program up to different files that you can load uh, separately. So this, let me go back. This one that depends on one and two, that can be bundled into one file. So that starts loading when this, when this code is run, but you don't have to load that file up immediately in your program. You can start loading it uh, when you need it. But well, that's, that's what will happen automatically. Uh, the downside to this compared to Browserify is that while Browserify, the Browserify model is, is simple and easy to understand and it's synchronous and so on, uh, the price that you're paying for doing things asynchronously is, is as, as usual when we're doing asynchronous things, that uh, it suddenly starts to get hard to understand what's going on, what's loaded when, and how do I optimize the order of when these things happen. Like, how big chunks should I split my uh, application code into to optimize performance? One huge bundle, well, that takes a long time to load when the app starts, so that's bad. But lots of files to load in parallel and load all of the time when I move around in my application, that's, that's not the best solution either. You have to like, find the middle way. And while Browserify doesn't allow you to do that, but always bundles it into one thing, Require.js allows you to do it, but it doesn't really help you do it. You have to figure out the best way to go about it yourself. So, moving on, uh, if you have any questions, by the way, you can just yell them out, but otherwise we'll do a session at the end. So now, now lastly, I talked about two different ways to, in your code, organize what should be loaded when and how things depend on each other. Uh, if we look at the other part of this, which is actually, actually, uh, storing and retrieving these packages that are reusable pieces of code, we can look at this thing called Jam, which is a package manager for JavaScript, just like NPM. But unlike other uh, repositories, they're talking about NPM, of course, we put the browser first. And this is not going to be very, uh, very different from what you've seen before. It's exactly the same thing. We have a new program, this time it's called Jam, and we say Jam install jQuery, and this installs jQuery onto uh, your current project. Uh, but it has no way to load them, to, to integrate them into your JavaScript code, so you have to use some, uh, some dependency management system uh, or module loader on top of that. For example, require. And if you've, uh, if you've specified that you want to use Jam and require together, it will create a file called, yeah, in this case, jam slash require.js that you can load. So this is the symbiosis between these two. Uh, and uh, yeah, since it's used with require.js, it looks exactly the same as the thing we saw before. We can say require jQuery, the function gets back the jQuery object, and then we can start using it right there. And we can publish packages the same way, pretty much, as we did with NPM. But the file looks slightly different, and it has a different name. But we still specify, like, 
what's this piece of code that I've written called? What's the current version? What other dependencies do I have? Um, and so on. Uh, and you can do it at the same time. This is actually an example of doing it at the same time, where the dependencies object up here is for uh, NPM, and the jam dependencies down there are for, for jam, if they, for some reason, would be different. <coughs> so yeah, jam compared to NPM is, is targeted at browsers. NPM has lots of packages that depend on access to the file system, uh, web server stuff, uh, other protocols like uh, TCP and so on uh, that you can't really use in the browser. You can install packages that are not usable, while Jam is just for the browser. It contains browser stuff only. Uh, and the downside is that the index is definitely not as large as NPM. Uh, it's the, the little brother. And it adds some packaging overhead if you want to work with both systems and if you want to be compatible with both. Everyone who creates a package suddenly has to maintain twice as much uh, complexity and, and uh, integration. So <clears throat> there's an even simpler or more, um, I should say, uh, less abstract version of this that's called Bower, which has gained a lot of traction like the, the last year or so. Uh, it's created by Twitter. And that, as well, is a package manager like NPM and like Jam. Uh, but what they're trying to achieve is, to quote them, build a generic, unopinionated solution to the problem of front-end package management. So they want to be kind of the platform for all the other tools to, to build upon. And it's actually dead simple, because Bower does not store store files. It just, it's just like, a, a, it's more like a name server or something. It maps names to whatever, uh, yeah, you, you want those names to mean. So you can use Bower to say install jQuery, or you can install a, a git URL, you can install a, a URL to an, a JS file, you can install uh, something that you have locally, whatever can be installed. And, and when you say, like in the first one, Bower install jQuery, what it does is the same thing as in the three next lines. It just installs some file somewhere. And the people who have created jQuery have, speci have, uh, uh, have submitted to Bower what jQuery points to. What file does that mean? Uh, so it's pretty much just a URL as well, but uh, masked behind a name. So just as with others, you can create a file. You can say, in my project, I want these different uh, packages. I want to use Mocha. I want to use Angular. I want to use Select2. I want to use Bootstrap. I want to use jQuery. And then you do a Bower install, the same way as uh, with other tools. And all of those are installed and readily available for you to use, except that there is no system here to load these files and so on. This puts, puts all the files that you wanted into your file system, and then you, you have to load them the old-fashioned way using a script tag pointing to that particular file. Uh, so the idea that Bower has is that the other tools, the, uh, uh, the Jam, uh, Jam Package Manager or Require and so on, can be built to support Bower, to use Bower uh, under the hood to fetch things, but then uh, supply the more abstract way of, of using them. So uh, the difference here is that it's, this is like super simple. Bower is just one-liners on, on your command line, and you fetch the files, and it looks as if you had downloaded it yourself. Uh, but you don't have to search the web and like figure out what versions you need and so on. Uh, at the time you, uh, you download, you write this file instead, say all the versions at once, and it's all there specif specified in a structured way. And it's very flexible. You can, uh, you can, can use it, or, is, uh, or you're at least supposed to be able to use it together with the other tools. Uh, 
And the downsides, of course, is that using just power doesn't really do a whole lot for you. It doesn't take, take it the whole way. It just downloads files for you. But it's, it's a very simple tool to get started with if you've never used any of these uh, to just see kind of the idea and what it's all about. So if we try to draw some conclusions from these like, very, very brief ov overviews, I definitely have not cov covered exactly how to use everything and uh, like how they work. But now you know of some of them and, and can start looking. But just as, as like templating engines in the JavaScript world is, is like a weed, uh, there are so many. I, I guess a lot of you have seen uh, LinkedIn's comparison when they wanted to choose a template engine for their new site. And they did this, this study of 38 different templating engines in order to find the best one. I mean, 38 solutions to exactly the same problem. That's like crazy. And <clears throat> frameworks are like a weed these days as well, right? With jQuery and Less and Backbone and Knockout and yeah, everything. We have frameworks for everything. So while, while JavaScript is great because it has so many different environments and different solutions, JavaScript is also hard for the same reason. And that applies to this package management and dependency management as well. Like, which one should I be using? Uh, which one is right for my use case? And uh, yeah, where, where, where should I start? That's the problem. And uh, I think we, while we should be more like this and just like embracing uh, Embracing the fact that we can't know everything up front. We just have to start using something and see where it takes us and so on. <clears throat> All developers are more like this. I want to have the coolest tools. I want to do everything the most awesome way right away and everything should be awesome. Uh, but let's, let's just do a quick review of some use cases for, for when they would be applicable. So I, I would say that if you have a small app uh, and you don't reload a lot, maybe you're writing a, like a single page application or such, and uh, maybe you're a Node.js fan, any of these, then npm and browserify is a really good way to go. While if you have a huge application that's really hard to get a grasp on, you definitely don't load all of the code up front, uh, and it's really hard to optimize that by hand then look at Jam and require JS instead, because they are designed to tackle that particular use case. And if you're more like, um, I want to take some baby steps, I just want to start scratching the surface of this thing, or maybe you're, uh, you're actually having an idea of an even better way to do all of this than what's already out there, then Bower is really good, because then you don't have to start from the absolute bottom where we just download sources from all over the internet, but you can reuse something. And if there's something you should never do for, for any reason because it just doesn't make sense, is to use something like uh, the Ender library. Uh, it was written way back before the rest of these ideas emerged and there's not really any reason to use it anymore. But I would say that uh, the most important thing is to just do your homework, Use your, use your brain, think about w what is it that I want, and go with that. And just whatever you do, just stop piling things on top of each other. That's it for me. Thank you. So that's a, a rush through different technologies. Any questions? Everyone is just keen to try something out, get their hands dirty. I don't have a live example with Drupal, but I have live examples with all the rest, and I can uh, I can tweet some links. So if you, there's my uh, my Twitter handle, follow it, and I'll uh, I'll let you know.
and they're all compatible with all backend frameworks. They're not coupled in any way with Node or anything else, so Drupal is perfectly fine. Okay, if there's nothing else, then uh, thank you so much.